Thank you again for being here. We're going to start the formal program with the incredible Robert Swan. Robert Swan is a polar explorer. He is a courageous voice. He's a doer and a speaker. He has dedicated his life to protecting Antarctica and the rest of the planet. He was the first person to walk to both poles. He is, has been named uh, the UN Goodwill Ambassador for Youth. He's a visiting professor at the School of Environment at Leeds University, and he's special envoy to the Director General of UNESCO. He is a friend and a fearless partner in this work we're doing, and I know you'll enjoy it. Please join me in welcoming Robert Swan. You got it. Thanks very much, Amy. Well, good afternoon, everybody. How are, how are you all? Good, excellent. The last great exploration left on Earth, I believe, is to survive on Earth. And the heroines and heroes of that exploration, you're it. And I'm going to tell you a story for the next 30 minutes all about what's possible to achieve together through teamwork, through community, through trust, but to get it done because that last great exploration has to be a success, has to be. So where did all this begin? This began for me at the age of 11. Good gracious, here we go. I hope. Um, bit of a slide attack here. No, we're on. Uh, if they stick, by the way, I'll, I'll say next. Otherwise, we could be here until midnight. So where did this began? begin? This began as a dream, and I think all of us must leave here remembering our dreams. They count. And at the age of 11, last time I was properly dressed, I saw a film about the real explorers who went to the North and South Poles, and I said, right, I'm in for this. Everybody laughed, they still laugh, but guess what? In between, we achieved that mission. These slides aren't happening, so next slide, please. So, what fascinated me as a kid, this last great true wilderness left on Earth, the Antarctic fascinated me, and next, and after many, 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 many years of battle to raise a lot of money when no one would listen, eventually three of us stood on the edge of the Antarctic continent, terrified. More people had stood on the moon at this moment in history than had walked to the pole. We were the first to walk to the pole or go overland since Scott and Amundsen, a hundred years before us. People said we'd die, we just knew we'd get very thin. I would lose 69 pounds in total in body weight on this journey. Each day, nine hours a day, seven days a week, 70 days in a row, we had no communications. We had no fancy watch where you press a button, no GPS. So we would navigate using the sun, a sextant, and this old watch to one building the size of this room in the center of a continent, Antarctica, twice the size of Australia, and we can't make mistakes. As we all know in life today, we seem to be losing trust. We don't really believe much about what anybody says anymore. And on an expedition, if you don't have trust, you're dead. So we've got to find trust again. And I think trust starts with us. If you don't trust yourself, who the hell's going to trust you? And we had to find trust as we went through these appalling crevasse zones. If you fall down one of these holes, you don't come back, you're dead. We came through and eventually are standing in an area the size of the United States of America, and we are on our own. Think of that. And beneath our feet in this photograph, 16,000 feet of solid ice. 
90% of all the world's ice, we're standing on it here. 70% of all the world's fresh water, we're standing on it. And trust me, ladies and gentlemen, that if we continue to melt this, we are going to swim. We're now closing in on the South Geographic Pole, and according to our planning, remember we have no iPhone 13 to ring up mummy. We're just hoping this is happening. Our ship should be returning 3,000 miles south of New Zealand, returning to our base, should be unloading an aeroplane onto an iceberg. That tiny plane will take off, come to the pole, look for us. And if they find us, we go back to base and do something that we promised to do. Imagine that 22-year-old kid trying to raise five million bucks to walk to the pole. I needed help. And the help came for me in the form of the great Jacques Cousteau from France. He gave me credibility. And you know one thing? When you leave here, give people credibility. It doesn't cost money, but it really does help. And he said to me, I'll help you, Rob. But at the end of your expedition, leave just your footsteps in the snow of the Antarctic continent. And after 70 desperate days, there was the South Geographic Pole. We had done it, the longest unassisted march ever made anywhere on Earth in history. Done! And we stood there, three of us, proud. And in all the rush we now call life, don't forget occasionally to stop and celebrate the moment. Don't just rush on to the next thing. It's what I've done all my life, and I've regretted it. But on this moment, we celebrated, and then we were told the news that our ship, Southern Quest, had sunk five minutes ago. Just the sort of bloody thing you want to hear when you've walked 900 miles, spoken to no one for a year, and the first thing you hear about is this. Everybody's safe. But I've got a few problems on my hands now. Biggest problem, that I promised Jacques Cousteau we would take away our equipment. 60 tons of it, no money, bankrupt, no ship, 3,000 miles to New Zealand. But you know something? If you've got the right team and you've got the right motivation, anything's possible. Jacques Cousteau inspired me and my mum who sadly we lost at 106 years and four months, only a few weeks ago. I was her seventh child, imagine that. Not easy for mum. But she inspired me, ever since I was here, to leave no trace. Wherever we went, we left no trace. In fact, try to leave it better than when we arrived. So, to cut a long story short, it took another year. People staying in Antarctica, but another year... Eventually, I got another ship in, picked up the rubbish, picked up the people, job done. Now, something happened to me that brought me here today. My eyes changed color in 70 days through damage. Our faces blistered out. Huge lumps of skin came off our face. We didn't know why. But when we got home, we were told by NASA that we'd walked under the hole in the ozone layer. We didn't know it was there. No fancy Oakley goggles in those days, so the ice, the ultraviolet rays had come through the hole, hit the ice, bounced back, fried the hell out of us. Bit of a shock. And when I got home, we tried to tell everybody this, and no one would listen, but eventually they did. In a world where we often feel hopeless, Without an ozone layer, nothing would have grown on this planet. Game over. And in 1987, governments got together, signed the Montreal Protocol, CFC gas is banned, and now the hole in the ozone is fixing itself. We can do it if we have the right motivation. So after the, this South Pole Catastrophe, we now move on to the North Pole. I thought I could pay off my debts by walking to the North Pole. I think I owed $1.2 million after losing the ship. I never had a job. You know, this was a tricky time. I thought, well, we'll go to the North Pole, make the dream happen, and pay off the debts. Possibly not the best financial decision I've ever made. So eight of us from seven different nations, 
now set off for the North Pole. A great moment. We are going to walk 700 miles every step away from the safety of land. In this picture, we're on ice above land. We now move onto ice above frozen ocean. 700 miles every step away from the safety of land. Off we go. This would be our home for 70 nights in a row. Eight of us, seven different nations. Check out Darrell on the right. He would become the first American to walk to the North Pole, but you can see how much he truly loved Rupert's music. Not much, I have to say. But in all of our lives, on this journey we're making <clears throat> towards sustainability, we have to be patient. We have to listen. And we learn patience inside that smelly tent as we go to the pole. Here's me coming in washing at minus 79 degrees Fahrenheit. Rather chilly. Gentlemen, you'll notice that there is nothing hanging down in the central area of the photograph. Extremely cold. <clears throat> We're now really near the pole. I'm thinking I'll never have to do this again ever in my life. And as we close in on the pole, the nightmare begins. Over four days, the entire ocean melts beneath our feet. We are 642 miles from land. No one knows where we are. And this is 30 years before words like climate change, global warming, ESG, sustainability. So we weren't standing there saying, oh, great, it's climate change. We were thinking, great, we're dead. Because no one can rescue us. But because we'd listened to each other, we came up with a plan, 40-hour days for seven days in a row, no sleep for a week. We can do it because it's always daylight at the North Pole in summer. So we attack the ice. People fall to bits. We're not some survivor discovery program. When things go wrong, you can sort of check into the limelight for the evening. When things go wrong, we deal with them. And Darrell, our brave American, he loses his heel off his foot through frostbite. He fights on 10 miles from the pole. We get some luck. Ice blows together, and we have a platform to stand at 90 North. We'd done this, not me. I'd still be in the warehouse talking about doing this in London. We had achieved this mission, and we were proud. And we flew a flag which I still think is important on this planet. I went home, thought I can go and see my mum, but no. Jacques Cousteau hauled me in immediately. Didn't say, well done, Robert, for all you've done. He looked at me and he said, what are you doing, young man, for the next 50 years? I said, well, can I have a cup of tea while you tell me? And he gave us, not me, us, 50 years ago, a mission. In the year 2041, the treaty that keeps Antarctica for us all. No one owns Antarctica. We all have a responsibility for it. In 2041, those agreements could be altered, could be changed, and could be thrown out. Wouldn't it be great if we just left one place alone as a natural reserve land for science and peace? One chance left on Earth and we can do it. So we've been working on that for 31 long years. Even my limited mathematics tells me we've got 19 years to go. So with our brave yacht 2041, we have sailed the seven seas. Why? Because if we're using more clean renewable energy here in the real world to massive scale, KPMG will save Antarctica because they'll tell everybody it doesn't make financial sense to go and exploit it if we're using more renewable energy here. It just won't make financial sense for coal, oil, and gas exploration. Huge voyage. Any yachts, women, or men here? 225,000 nautical miles at sea, showing, don't tell people, show them to inspire. Showing people how, if we could run a yacht on renewable energy around the world, surely we could do that in the real world. 
solar panel sales, engines running off different types of biofuels, synthetic fuels. We tried very hard. And every year, we go to Antarctica. Just back a few weeks ago, but every year we take business women, business men, lots of young people to make them champions for Antarctica, but also hopefully give them skills to be better leaders. So, in 19 years' time, I can ring them all up when they're head of Goldman Sachs or something and say, right, game on. Now we're going to save Antarctica, support what we're doing. So, I'm very proud of this. We have more women than men who apply to join us. I'm really proud to say I've taken 80 fantastic women from the Middle East, often from countries, ladies, where men have never gone before them, so they become the first from their nation, and they do a fantastic job inspiring young people on return. We have taken hundreds of fantastic young people and old people from India. People forget that India has 1.4 billion people. There are more young people in India under 25 than there are people in the whole of the United States of America. Massive scale. And everybody in India deserves to have what we all have. And if they get all that we have, using often the same resources and energy that we still use here, then we're going to swim. So we have a lot of connection with India, a lot of connection with China. These are the future empires on Earth. There was something called the British Empire. Look at the state of it now. We're a bunch of losers on an island that can't even stay part of Europe. It's embarrassing. Right now, there is the American Empire. But sadly, that's going down. These are the future empires on Earth that will influence our survival on Earth. And hopefully, if I have my way, our way, they'll help preserve Antarctica. And what we see there, ladies and gentlemen, is terrifying. I go every year. And I'm sure more senior people who live in this area can look at the mountains, go up into the mountains and say, this has changed. Same in Antarctica. Huge areas of ice pouring off this continent. I cannot stand... People who say to me, well, of course, Robert, India is a problem. And I say, yeah, what's the solution? Then they say no more. People are focused on the negative. So I thought, damn it, no point taking a yacht to India. It would be pointless. If there's one small word I ask you to remember from our story, remember it's ours, is the word relevant. It's very easy in this struggle we're on, this journey we're on, to think we're being relevant. Well, it's worth checking that you still are. Because sometimes you can think you're being relevant to the people you love, to the people that love you, your community, your country, the planet. Wake up one day and you're not so relevant. So it's important, I think, to have a check that you are. So to be relevant in India often is very painful. So I spent three years on a blasted bicycle going around India, which was much more dangerous than walking to the South Pole in my underpants. <laughs> Anybody can see the color of the traffic signal, can see why I enjoy India. I mean, there are no rules. It's great. But this was desperately hard and very dangerous. Why did I do it? Not because it was fun. But it was relevant to the kids, to the businesses, to the young people. Had I arrived in a sort of limousine in a white suit and said, well, really, we ought to clear up this, you lot. They would have hated it. So try and be relevant. And on the trips around India, the great journeys that we were lucky to make, we went to the source of the Ganges River that provides half a billion people with water. Half a billion and that glacier is going back at crawling speed. Ever been thirsty? And all over the world, with our tiny little team, we've built these education stations. There's no one at them. But local people, schools, colleges go in there, and powered by renewable energy, 
They can now, they used to do it on Skype, but that disappeared. Now on Zoom, they can communicate with schools all over the world. We take every year renewable energy high up into the Himalayas, often solar panels on our backs, which is really annoying. And a couple of years ago, we gave power to this monastery for the first time. They'd never had electricity. So this guy could see what he was doing for the first time in 2,000 years. This young pe person hated me because they had to do homework after 6 o'clock at night because they now have a solar torch. All these things that we try and do are really small. And on their own, they, they mean nothing, not a thing. But I think lots of small things together can bring hope can bring people together. And I think it's worth continuing. Frankly, I was thinking about having a holiday. But no, I was called in to see NASA. I love NASA. They're not emotional. And they just give you the facts <laughs> with strange glasses at a different angle. My sort of people. And they dragged me in there, made a big mistake by taking my son there, possibly one of the biggest mistakes I've ever made. You'll meet him in a minute, my son Barney. Shouldn't have taken him, should have gone on my own. They showed us all this and they said, Rob, these massive areas of Antarctica are starting to melt. That bottom area is the size of France that's colored, the top one's the size of Texas. These are big areas. And they said to me, why is no one taking it seriously, Rob? And being me, I said, possibly because you're being rather boring. I don't know. And Barney, who's got very used to this since he was about this big, sort of kicked his father under the table saying, Dad, out, before you say the wrong thing. And up until this moment, ladies and gentlemen, I've been trying to preserve Antarctica. And suddenly I realized that unless we think about it, Antarctica is going to come and get us. 90% of the world's ice, 70% of the world's fresh water. Only an eighth of an iceberg, you see. It's why the Titanic came off second, a lot of ice. And it may not matter to us in our rather comfortable existences. We can build walls, sort it somehow, because we've got the money. But imagine being a person in the Maldives that has to move house and they never did anything to deserve it. Barney and I know this family. And they didn't have anywhere to go, we should think. So Barney, this is my son, uh, practicing being an Australian. You'll find out why in a minute. He said, Dad, listen, just listen for once, Dad. Carry on saving Antarctica. But really, my generation are very angry indeed with what your generation have left us. And he said, but dad, if there's one thing you've taught me, you don't get anywhere by being angry, do you? And I said, no. And he said that my generation are seriously angry and I don't blame them. But a lot of people are gaining more likes and more following by being angry. What about some solutions? And I'm so proud of so many things that are happening here that are about solutions, because we don't really have time just to be angry. So he said, Dad, carry on saving Antarctica. I said, this is sounding good. I will try and come up with some things which will inspire young people on solutions. I said, Barney, this is terrific, young man. And I thought, there's got to be a catch somewhere, and there was. He said, Dad, will you walk to the South Pole with me again? I said, no, absolutely no. He said, but Dad, you will have crossed the whole of Antarctica on foot. And I said, well, so what? And then he said, well, what happens if we do it on renewable energy only? I said, right, I'm in. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, if we do the same, we get the same. And to change means sacrifice. It really means changing something. We can't pretend to keep doing all the things we do and to throw away our good old fossil fuels was a major catastrophe. That's the thing we've survived on for 30 years. So we went to NASA, they built us these incredible ice melters, they'll use these on Mars one day, there's a thought, and off Barney and I went, the first ever renewable energy expedition, two companions, great people, 
And I thought, I've got this. I've got this. And it was great to go south with my son. Generations must join together. 300 miles in, complete catastrophe. My hip disintegrates as I'm walking, and for the first time in my polar career, I fail. This was desperate. Imagine leaving your 23-year-old son to carry on with two companions, leaving him. He said, Dan, I've got this. I fail. He and two companions go on. He loses a toe in the process, but he is willing to suck that one up. And I managed to fly into the pole to celebrate his moment, not mine, his. As soon as possible, ladies and gentlemen, let's pass the baton over to the next generation. They deserve it. So where Barney is now, he is replanting the oldest rainforest in the world in far north Queensland in Australia. There were trees growing here when there were trees growing in Antarctica. It's been around a while. And he has found an area that was hacked down, no permission necessary, 50 years to grow bananas, and completely against the odds, without his father's help. He's buying this land, huge battle against storms and all kinds of things. And I'm proud to say, I know he's been here a couple of times, uh, in my place, uh, I, I really am proud of what he's doing. He's planting 20,000 trees in the next three weeks. Those trees will grow to 2,000 years old. Good job, Barney. But there was no backing off. Um, sorry, I might be a couple of minutes over, but it was a bit of a rocky start with the slides, but we're now in the flow. I was not going to look at a map of Antarctica for the rest of my life, thinking there were 300 miles to go. So, new hip put in, end of 2019, remember that date, I fly in, 300 miles from the pole, fantastic team. I was so lucky to persuade Katinka and Johanna, the top preeminent polar explorers of our time, to escort the old warrior to the pole, to lead me to the pole. So lucky to get them, amazing people. Plus Kyle, our brilliant cameraman, taking incredible new technology. You're gonna love this, ladies and gentlemen. I had jet aviation fuel made from the CO2, the dirt we put into the atmosphere. Think of that. Suck the dirt out, make fuel. Incredible. My dark glasses, for this journey were made out of CO2, the dirt we put into the atmosphere. Anything's possible, we need to support that innovation. So off we went. This was great. Hip perfect. Led, no more stiff upper lip British nonsense. Johanna and Katinka, I would sort of say at the end of the day, well, surely we should carry on for a while. And they said, Robert, go to your room. Off you go. Need to rest. Rehydrate, we'll see you in the morning. Perfect leadership, and I have to say that for a few days, I've enjoyed this. We get 97 clicks out from the pole. Nearly there. I will have crossed the whole of the Antarctic landmass, 97 miles to go, 2,200 miles on foot over 30 years. You can almost see it. And I made such a bad mistake took my focus off, started thinking about going home, got out of the tent, fell over, and my brand new hip blew out of its socket, leaving me lying in the snow, again a failure. Twice now, a broken person got back home, flew to the pole, it, it was just awful. Got back home, COVID hit, but I thought, damn it, who the hell am I? <laughs> so a few more nuts and bolts put in the hip, and in December, of course, we're going back to finish those 97 miles to the South Geographic Pole. I think we, we, we're allowed to call ourselves this undaunted. <laughs> Quite like it, really. But me just going there is completely pointless, really. It's just for me. So I thought, who could I take who had a better story, really inspirational people? So I'm lucky to have a whole team of wounded veterans, all women, men, colors, creeds, fantastic team of people who've suffered because of war. 
and war should never darken the doors of the Antarctic continent. And lots of veterans, sadly, today are taking their own lives. Why? Because they don't have a mission. So I'm going to have veterans for the planet, veterans for the Antarctic, great stuff. And you know something? Through all these setbacks in life, two times now, knocked back from the pole, felt a failure. But I've waited ever since I was 11 to have National Geographic make a film about us. Everybody else has, but they never did. I'm proud to say they're making a film of Undaunted. You know, if you hang on in there, anything can happen. Two weeks ago in Antarctica, beautiful, amazing. But guess what? It rained in Antarctica. And quite frankly, I'm sick and tired of hearing bad news. We've got to now focus on solutions. 19 years to go until 2041. And I spend my life now <clears throat> traveling around the world. I'm great um, friends with Eamon Storr. I think you're here, Eamon, somewhere. Hi, my friend. Eamon and I, he's at uh, Fair Share. Getting messages across, especially to employees, that we can have all these fancy ESG moments and missions and everything, but we should really be engaging with employees. So I think these words count. I quite like them. And I finish with this, that the last great exploration left on Earth is for us to survive on Earth. And if you can do or dream you can, Begin it now, for boldness has genius, power, and magic in it. Amy, love you. Thanks for inviting me. Thank you.